I'm going to go over commonly missed questions from multiple choice Monday number two. Let f be a function with f of three equals two, f prime of three is negative one, f double prime of three is six, and the third derivative at three is 12. So which of the following is the third degree Taylor polynomial? The answer is A. So a Taylor polynomial is the value of the function at a particular point plus the value of the derivative at that point times x minus that point plus the second derivative times x minus the center squared over 2 factorial plus the third derivative times x minus the center cubed over 3 factorial. So what we have is 2 plus 3, oh I'm sorry that's negative 1, plus negative 1 times x minus 3 plus 6 times x minus 3 squared over 2 factorial which is 2 plus 12 times x minus 3 cubed over 3 factorial. 3 factorial is 6. So we end up with 12 divided by 6 is 2, and 6 divided by 2 is 3. So A is our correct answer. Region in the plane is bounded by the graph of y equals 1 over x. The x-axis, the line x equals m, and the line x equals 2m. So here's the graph of 1 over x. Here's m and 2m. They want to know something about this area. And what happens if m changes? So we take the integral. The integral is the natural log. Then we plug in 2m and m. And then we know that um, one of the properties of logs is that if you have uh, two logs of the same base, natural log has the same base, obviously. If you subtract them, then that's the same thing as the log of that base. This would be the numerator and this would be the denominator. You're allowed to divide the interiors of the logs. So 2m over m is 2, and the natural log of 2 is a constant. And since it's constant, that means that the area of the region is not dependent on m. For any time t greater than or equal to 0, position of a particle on the xy plane is given by these two things. Then the acceleration vector, well it looks like everybody got it right in my class that had taken it by 6 p.m. on Sunday, but uh, both of these things appeared to be listed and everybody picked that. So I just wanted to let you know if it was labeled as wrong, it doesn't appear that there's any difference to me. Point on the curve x squared plus 2y equals 0 that is nearest to 0, negative 1 half. So I put a graph on here. I would think the easiest way to do this problem is to just understand that this is a parabola centered at 0, or vertex at 0, 0, opening down with, um, and just kind of understanding how to graph that like you were in Algebra 2, and then seeing where everything is. Because this would have been a no calculator question on the AP test. So if you're looking at this, you would see that this would be 1 half, this would be 1, and then this would be greater than 1. So obviously the answer is 0, just if you have an understanding of graphs. Um, and then also y equals 1 half, there's no y values of this function that actually equal 1 half. Uh, so that's probably the easiest way to do it if you have an understanding of what the function graphs look like. Uh, but you can also try to use calculus. So the distance is equal to x minus the point squared plus y minus the y value of the point squared. And then I made a substitution, x squared equals negative 2y, which I got from the function. And then, so this is x, so I replaced it with negative 2y. Then I just did some algebra 
found that the distance, the distance from the point to any point on the curve is always the same as y equals negative one half. So you would think, well, where is the distance equal to zero? The distance would be equal to zero when y is one half, right? Well, there's no value at y equals one half. So that's why that was given a, listed as an answer choice, but y equals one half uh, never works. So then what would minimize this? Well, if you take the derivative, you get a constant one, right? So nothing actually minimizes it unless you understand that there is a maximum y value or there's some sort of restrictions on the y value. So because there are restrictions on the y value, the y value has to be between negative infinity and zero in this function. Therefore, what value in the domain, well, or the range, I guess, since it's y's, what value in the range of this function would actually minimize this? Um, and that would be y equals zero. Now, if you, um, yeah, so that's basically all there is to it. Uh, which of the following series converges for all real numbers x? Uh, this is the only one that converges. Uh, you notice there's an n factorial in the denominator. n factorial is dominant. Anytime you see a factorial, it dominates the function. So since there's a factorial in the denominator and everything else is not a factorial, this one is going to win. Um, now, the one that most of the people that got it wrong in my class picked that is not the correct answer is actually um, basically like kind of like the harmonic series, basically. So um, this would uh, this would not work for any x value that's one or bigger. Um, now, if x is negative one, it would work because it's the negative harmonic series and stuff. But even if you just plug in n, you get one over n, and that clearly doesn't work. Um, and then if you have um, letter b, which would probably be the other one that makes the most sense maybe to possibly converge. Um, once you start plugging in numbers that are bigger than one, what you end up with is the numerator grows faster than the denominator because an exponential function, <clears throat> which is what happens because we're plugging in bigger and bigger n's, exponential functions grow bigger than polynomial functions. The letter E, uh, that definitely doesn't work. The factorial in the numerator makes that way, way big. Uh, the table of values above gives f, f prime, g, and g prime, and we know that h is equal to f of g of x, so what is h prime of 1? So h prime of x is equal to f prime of g of x times g prime of x. That is the chain rule. And so if we want h prime of 1, that's f prime of g of 1 times g prime of 1. So g of 1 is negative 1. So I need f prime of negative 1 times g prime of positive 1. So I just replace g of 1 with negative 1. So f prime of negative 1 is 5. g prime of 1 is 2. 5 times 2 is 10. Tangent of xy equals x, then dy dx equals. Well, this is going to be implicit differentiation. So uh, we're just going to implicitly differentiate everything. So we have secant squared xy. Uh, that would be the derivative of the tangent. And then I need the derivative of the inside, which is going to be a product rule. So what I have here is um, derivative of x is just 1 times y plus the derivative of y, which is dy dx, times x. And then that's equal to the derivative of x, which is 1. So now what I have to do is I have to solve for dy dx. So I'm going to divide by secant squared of xy. So I have y plus x dy dx equals 1 over secant squared of xy. 
Now notice that secant squared in the denominator is the same thing as cosecant, I'm sorry, cosine squared in the numerator. So I'm just going to rewrite this. And then I subtract y and divide by x. And so if I have cosine minus y divided by x, that's the answer. Radius of a sphere is decreasing at a rate of 2 centimeters per second. At the instant when the radius of the sphere is 3 centimeters, what is the rate of change in square centimeters per second of the surface area of the sphere? So they tell you the surface area of a sphere. So if we take the derivative with respect to time, this is going to equal 8 pi r dr dt. So now we're just going to plug everything in. So radius of sphere is decreasing 2 centimeters per second. So this is negative 2. 3 centimeters times 8 pi. This will give us the rate of change of the surface area with respect to time. 8 times 3 times negative 2 is negative 48. During a certain epidemic, the number of people that are infected at any time increases at a rate proportional to the number of people that are infected at that time. If 1,000 people are infected when the epidemic is first discovered and 1,200 people are infected seven days later, <clears throat> so what that means is if I want to find some function, it, this is exponential in nature. That's how uh, epidemic things happen. So it increases at a rate proportional to the number of people infected at any given time. That basically means exponential. So what I can do is I can plug in 1,200. I can plug in 1,000 for the initial amount of people infected. And then B to the 7, because it's 7 days later. So what I would do is I would get B equals the 7th root of 1.2. So then what I can do is figure out what is Y when B, which is the 7th root of 1.2 is taken to the 12th power. Well, that's 1367. That would be my answer. Um, what you could also do in a problem like this is if you understand that the number of people infected at any time increases at a rate proportional to the number of people infected at that time, if you're not really sure how to do something like that. Um, so then that would be um, the rate with respect to time, and in this case, that's x, it's proportional to the number of people that are infected. So maybe I should have put x as t in this problem, but uh, just make sure that you know that x is time as I continue to do this. So if you want, you can start with the differential equation, and then you end up with dy over y equals k dx, you integrate both sides, you get the natural log of y is kx plus c. You get y equals e to the kx plus c. And then usually what happens is you just realize that that, um, that c value kind of comes out front and becomes some initial value. Well, what is the initial value? The initial value is 1,000. And you could solve this with E's as well. So you could plug in um, 1,200 for Y and 7 for X and get a K value. And then once you plug that K value in, then you can plug in 12 for X and you'd get Y. And again, it would be 1367. So and you could do it kind of the long way, or you could realize that when this is true, when you have uh, increases at a rate proportional to the number of people infected, that's just a... Um, that's just an exponential function. And then you could solve it like you did in Algebra 2.